What's up, B Cappers? Welcome to the seventh annual Black and Brown Comics Arts Festival. You have no idea how much energy and effort and love and mischief has gone into this year. So I'm here today with one of the co-founders of the festival, UC Irvine professor, comic media scholar, graphic artist, artist, comic creator, Mr. John Jennings. Hello, sir. How are you? How you doing, man? Thank you for having me. Thank you for being a co-founder uh, and organizer yourself. Also, thank you for giving me this other job at Irvine. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rivers. It's all good. It's all okay, good. I forgot. I keep I get those anything I'm south good. anything south of Berkeley. I don't know. A lot of people do that. <laughs> it happens all the time. But no, I, it's a great school. But so you at Riverside. My wife went to Irvine. That's the problem. Ah, Yo, my wife graduated from UC Irvine and New York. Professor. <laughs> no, no, it is of course. That's that's my job. Cause she's not here and I won't get beat up. No, but thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, absolutely. And so when I'm talking to creators, I always ask um, a, a, a variation of this question because I think it's important. So why you and why this? What is it about you specifically that allows for you to feel so connected to the graphic form? Oh, you know, that's interesting. I, 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 that's a tough question because I've always loved as far, as far as I can remember, I've always loved images. You know, even as a, my mom said, even as a child, I was really attracted to like graphic imagery, you know, as far as like uh, cartoons and illustrations. And even like, you know, she had these like psychology books, these illustrated psychology books from when she was in school um, that had like all kinds of symbols and, you know, just esoteric meanderings that were graphic. And I just always been attracted to them, you know, I always had, had an affinity for them. And I started drawing at a very young age, you know, and, um, you know, she said I was like trying to make marks like super early, like three or four, you know, just trying mm -hmm. to draw, you know, and I distinctly remember drawing Thor or like, well, badly <laughs> inside of an Otis Redding album that I ripped apart when I saw you know, like the, the cover. Yeah, you know? Oh, yeah. The, and, and, but and, for those of you who don't know, there's, these, there's this thing called vinyl. And they, used to come, and they used to come into these these square cardboard things that would fold open and give you an entire world. Exactly, exactly. And so, like, um, when I looked inside the, the the vinyl cover, I noticed that there was white paper. It was like clear on the inside. So I just, oh, this is. So I just ripped it open. And it, oh, not and Otis. It vinyl, but you know the cover. <laughs> right? I know, right? And like, <laughs> like that was so horrible. And my mom didn't even, she didn't even do it. She was, you know. I was just drawing. And so I drew a Thor on the inside of the Otis Redding album <laughs> cover. Uh, but yeah, but um, I think that's part of like, I, I, it's just an innate uh, response to me to do that kind of work. I, and I can't explain it. You know, it's, it's. Um, I wish I did have a, an ex explanation, but I've always just been attracted to that, to that form, you know. And I hate the word calling because there's just too much baggage to the word calling. But yeah. I, it seems that the work that you do is really closely aligned with your values. Well, yeah, right. And yeah. I wonder, like, what? And so, when it comes to, like the graphic form for public consumption, what are some of your artistic values? Well, here's the thing. I think, um, you know, one of the things I think about is I don't really think about high and low art. You know, I really don't like that notion that there's certain types of art that should be in museums and there's certain types of art that people consume and throw away, kind of thing. Um, I, mean, I think that you can love Frank Miller and Rodin at the, in the same the same way, you know. And I just don't distinguish it because I think that that's just a type of snobbery and, you know, um, class based tomfoolery that I'm not I don't really get down with. So you know, I'm always trying to put Pete, you know, trying to like level that playing field, so to speak. The other thing is that you know I'm teaching the academy, right? I'm in you know a uh, tenured professor, been teaching in the academy for like oof, twenty some odd years now, you know, and. Um, you know, been tenured since like 2008. And so I'm very, very, uh, you know, privileged to be in that space. But there's a lot of like folk who really look down upon like, you know, popular culture and things of that nature too. And so I'm always trying to figure out ways to bridge that gap between like theory and practice, you know? And there's something that's really um, vital and energetic and accessible about the cartoon, about the comics, you know, because you can get out really, really uh, in-depth notions around society and around like theory through abstraction. You know, comics are a type of abstraction. So that's something that that's always kind of attracted me to the form as well. Like it's very direct, you know. And the fact is like anybody can make a cartoon. Everybody's uh, is not going to draw like Ross Andrew or like you know Jack Kirby or somebody. 
but everybody can make marks. Everybody has ideas and anyone can make a comic book. And that's the other thing I like about it too, is very subversive in that fashion, that if you can put images together in a sequence and then you can actually make a comic. It doesn't have to be drawn. It could be photos like the It's Italian. fairly democratic in a way. It's very democratic and it's an easy access and it's very, you can get into it really, really quickly. And basically if you can make a book, then you can take it down to your copy shop and your publisher. And yeah. it's something to me that's been always really great about it. It's like, for me, you know, being someone who grew up dyslexic and not to mention having a level of color blindness, mm. it was always, for me, my appeal for comics was, how did these static images force me to see them as continuous motion, right? right? Like, like that for me was something like, like I, I filled in the, the blanks between mm -hmm. panels, right? Like, I can't always appreciate the depth of color all the time because depending on you know, what the colors are, <laughs> right? But there's something about that, the idea that I can take this two-dimensional set of images, force your brain to connect them all into a coherent story, right. while also adding visual and textual subtext, That's right. <laughs> like, you know, all at the same time. And so for people to say that comic, the comic art form is low, Right. Art is literally the dumbest thing in the world because it's yes. actually it's it's fundamentally not true because most people are understanding now the absolute power of the graphic novel in mm -hmm. terms of literacy, in terms mm -hmm. of politics, right. in terms of cultural history preservation, Definitely. right? Or illuminating things. We have books coming out about Tuskegee, we have books coming out about Tulsa, Oklahoma. David F. Walker did a book about the Black Panther Party yeah. in Oakland. I mean, like so like the, the idea is that what for me, what the graphic form does, it's makes what was form what was formerly probably inaccessible to a lot of people mm -hmm. more more accessible for a mass of people and I don't think that's high low I think that's actually a public service. No, I think I think I totally agree. I mean, my whole thing is I feel like, you know, you can reach more people through that form. You know, I can definitely like write this you know high pollutant erudite piece about you know whatever I'm studying, but. You, you turn it into like a something that's actually readily pr produced and, and mass produced and something that's actually uh, engaging. You just reach more people with your ideas, you know, and as a graphic designer and someone who's a visual communicator, it's important for me to get my ideas out, you know, <laughs> so I'm like, and I'm like, hmm, what form is good for this? Ah, okay. Because I think, I you know, think from it as a, as a graphic designer, you know, if you want to you know, move people, if you want to uh, get your ideas across very, very quickly, you know, the cartoon is a is a really well designed uh, device for, to do that, you know, and then when you talk about sequence, oh my goodness, you know, everybody loves stories, we're made out of stories, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, I think it's, I think it's an, it was a natural thing for me, I love uh, storytelling from different back, you know, different types of uh, storytelling, I love film, um, I'm also a huge fan of music as well, which is a totally different type of storytelling, and I love, mm -hmm. Uh, being able to, to to merge the streams, so to speak, to cross the streams. Um, so what you're talking about too is like this idea of multimodal literacy, right? Where you you're reading things in different modes. And actually, a lot of times when I'm lecturing about comics, I'll ask people. I said, "Well, you ever seen CNN, you know, or like MSNBC or something like that?" And most people have these days for sure, because we're glued to the sets. <laughs> but uh, when you see a newscaster, you see the newscaster. You see this band of information under them. You see like a, you know, stuff going in the background. Sometimes you have several screens split up, right? Um, and you that's a comic. You basically, it, it's a, you have these like uh, images that are juxtaposed in deliberate sequence to borrow from Scott McCloud. Um, that's a comic, you know? So you're actually watching, you, you're actually surrounded by sequential art costs. And it's crazy how the the, the, the the comification of the news happened over the last 20 years. The comic. It used to, you know, it used to just be just somebody boring in a horrible suit Yes. Talking to the screen. Now it's like, we're going to overlay. Now it's kind of like, um, you know, Jonathan Hickman type comics. Here's a, here's right. a, you know, here's a little hyperlink over here. here. I mean, and it's crazy how that type of sequ <laughs> sequential language has entered the public parlance, right? Like this is now, this is the thing. And people won't attribute it to that, of course. But you start looking at when comics made that shift to kind of like, we're going to grow up now. Right. New, news followed suit. Mm-hmm. No, really, yeah. And something you said really struck me because I remember, like, you know, when I, you know, teaching, like, I remember teaching um, Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. taught the book, and then I also gave them one of the old school classics comic books oh, rep reproduction to, 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 to do. Then I gave them a French comic version 
of it. Okay, let's and the, no, no, I mean, I speak French. I mean, but they, my class doesn't speak French, but I was like, okay, I'll help you translate. But let's look at all of this as one text. That's right. It just shines the light on something different. Right. And there's something about what you do in your work is that you kind of make us understand that even if even though your books may be a standalone or one or two series or a whole graphic novel, yeah, you are really you, you seem to be really intentional about showing that this is part of a textual con uh, a continuum or connects or textual uh, relationship. So I'm kind of wondering where does that come from to make sure it's connected to something else. You know, um, that's a good question too. I mean, I think what it is is that I have a an underlying like uh, I guess I call it a mythopoetic that I've been mm -hmm. kind of with, um, especially, especially after like getting into Afrofuturism, Black speculative culture, and politics. I'm trying to create a alternative to what has been given to us by the West. You know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. about this idea like these Westernized European notions of what storytelling is. I'm always like yourself. I mean, uh, I'm trying to, to look at um, well, what's being generated by Black people. You know, what kind of folklore comes up that we generate, and and then mix it up with the fact that yo, know, I, I have aspects of myself that are, you know our ancestors from Africa, like most of us do, right? Um, but I was raised in the South, and I'm you know, and I grew up watching Cold Jack the Night Stalker and reading X Men, you know that kind of thing, you know. And I want to make things like that too, but I also want to pay homage to an Afrocentric perspective. And I think um, trying to weave together a, a mythopoetic that services all of those things is part of what I do. And so, you know, it's funny because now I'm thinking about it, for a long time, I was really like, I, I really didn't want to have like a shared universe kind of thing with my characters and things like that at first, because I think they, they really kind of put me off uh, when I was you know, in the 90s, right? When, when they were oh. like, was on X-Men comics and, you know, all those crossovers, which we still do. Right? Yeah, they're doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I was kind of put off by that, I think, for a while. But now I'm like, you know what? Actually having these characters be being built off of a, a mythological kind of like similarity or like mm -hmm. story world, you know, maybe maybe it's a good thing. So I kind of like that's what it is. So I'm trying to create like these connected worlds. You know? And I think it's important, too, because I don't think that people understand that the African diaspora has its own mythology That's what I'm and its own folklore. Because I mean, you, if you, you if you read Joseph Campbell, all he said was, "Yeah, you're not going to listen to the wild-eyed, bug-eyed shaman or whatever dumb shit Joseph Campbell's dumbass said." Right. <laughs> right. You know, I'm, I hate Campbell. Sorry, I, I studied him forever, and I'm like, "Yeah, you're wrong about almost everything." And so, <laughs> but I mean, but then you look at Clyde W. Ford with the hero with the African face. That's and right. What Clyde W. Ford did was like, oh, and that kind of reified some of the interest. And then you look at kind of like in that same vein of what like. Kajo, uh, Kojo Oshun did with More Brilliant Than the Sun yeah. by being able to look at Sonic mythology Sonic and mythology. being able to, like, what we're doing in the, what's happening now. And so, and not to mention what Black Twitter does. Black Twitter creates net lore yes. on a daily basis. On a, yeah. <laughs> on a minute by minute basis. Net. And so why is it important for you, outside of the obvious, that Blackness and African diasporaness actually gets to the level of the mythic? You know, um... I think it's because we're due because you know our people are really wonderful storytellers from the get-go you know we kind of like just spoke the world into existence in some way, right and i'm just tired of that that that, that monomyth that that monolithic idea you know i'm also tired of having to um show empathy to you know one you know white uh patriarchal you know um protagonist after the other you know and of course, no, you know, no uh, offense to you know Sherlock Holmes and Conan and Peter Parker mm -hmm. and what have you, but you know, it's time for them to look at us. You know, it's time for them, you know, it's for the world to realize, like you know, there are some amazing heroes that just happen to have more melanin in their, in their skin. Than yeah. you, do. you know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> so, and you and you're redefining the default. Cause I think it's important that you know, cause it's like it's how like you know Friends and Seinfeld are TV shows, but Living Single and Girlfriends are black shows. Right. Like why? Why is that? Like, why aren't we the cult? Even though y'all steal from us every chance you get, right. like, so why, why aren't we the default? And so, I think that also having a cultural default, but also having a a mythic cultural default stemming from Africanness, right. Africanity, yes. blackness is dope. And I think that's something that I think you have done so well with your 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 faithful um, and almost I won't say enhancing that may be a little bit overselling it, but like when you did Parable of the Sower, 
mm. Parable of the Talents, you and Dr. Damien Duffy, you took what are two fantastic seminal novels, but you also force us as a reader to read the novel differently by mm. even the choice of camera angles and lettering and the other things that you've done. And right. what you've just done, with, I mean, David Brame did the did the art, but you did yep. the colors and the writing for the um, Nnedi Okorafor's um, After the Rain. Yes. You just dropped that a week ago, two weeks ago. Yes. And that was another thing that you did. It was like, okay, now you're also showing us that, first of all, doing three women's adaptations in a row is dope. I mean, two <laughs> women and one, which is really dope. I mean, but I think it's also gives us this idea like, oh, yes, we exist not just on a on a deficit continuum. That's right. We exist in a mythic continuum, in a heroic continuum. That's right. right? We're part of that. Like Michael Moorcock would say, like the like the eternal hero yeah, or eternal. whatever. I mean, but there's something like that's dope about that. And so yeah. just mm -hmm. kind of curious, like, do you feel responsibility, even though you're the one who initiating it, but now that you've initiated it and you've been known as the guy on mm -hmm. this, like, do you feel the responsibility or do you feel like it's a shared responsibility with you and your other co-artists and your other, like, your, your crew? I definitely feel that responsibility to get things right and to put out the work and put out really great, compelling work that represents us, you know? Um, I'm, I can't really speak to the team of folk that are putting it. I'm assuming that they have a similar, <laughs> that they have a similar vibe. Um, I know def definitely Damien does, you know, definitely David does. Uh, and most of the people I work with have have, have a sense of, uh, you know, pride and responsibility around the stories that we're telling. Um, but I definitely feel like, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, uh, I can actually uh, foster these stories and, and be a facilitator, you know, mm -hmm. and I take that very seriously. It's, it's a, it's an honor to be able to do that. It's a lot of work, you know, but, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I definitely feel the weight of that, you know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to wedge the door open as much as possible, as long as I can, you know, so. Yeah. And so. it seems like. With your with your new imprint with Abrams Comic Arts Megascope, you not only wedge the door open, you're kind of taking the door off its hinges. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I was like, oh, I'm just kind of, you know. But no, I mean, the the types of work that we're getting ready to put out, even is just uh, I'm very excited about like Hard Ears, you know, the new, uh, you know, uh, and it's and it's from what and it's West Indian. Bo bo bo. Yep. See, <laughs> and hey, um, even though it's not Jamaican, but I, I'm still okay with the West Indian massive. That, Big ups. Appreciate that. The, the count <laughs> the, takes place in the Caribbean as well. So, yeah. yeah so it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, so that's Count Monte Cristo, as a you know Afro futurist uh, solar punk story set 400 years after the ice polar ice cap ice caps melt. And I do Ayize, who's another co-founder, uh, wrote it. Yes. So, <laughs> so anyway, so. Yeah, we're trying to do some interesting things with things that seem familiar. And, you know, Meg Megascope wants to change the way that we look at uh, literature, but also in, 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 in perspectives, you know. Everything's not going to be like, oh, this is the Caribbean version of this thing. It's yeah. a lot of original stuff, too. But I like the idea of like, hey, let's let's look at this particular story from this other perspective. It's, it's been kind of fun to kind of reimagine things like that, you know. So what is Megascope and what, you touched on it just now, but what is Megascope and what is it, what its primary, what is its primary mission, pardon me? So Megascope is a new imprint from uh, Abrams Comic Arts. Um, Abrams Comic Arts is a sub, is, a, is an imprint of uh, Abrams Books, which uh, is the first art book publisher in America, actually. Uh, founded, I think, in 1948 by Harry, Harry Abrams. And so basically, Abrams started out doing a lot of art books, like you know, books about Cezanne and about Picasso and things of that nature. And then I want to say in like the early 80s, they kind of start segueing into popular culture. They did books about Disney and such. And before you know it, they started doing really well with these pop culture books. And they're beautifully produced. I they're mean, gorgeous. They're gorgeous books. Yeah, they're, um, their slogan is uh, the, uh, the art of book, the art of books. You know? So it's all about... You know, really, really fine production qualities, you know, looking at image culture. They actually look at like popular popular culture books around Star Wars and things of that nature. And Comic Arts was founded about 10 years ago. And after we did the um, the Octavia Butler book, uh, Kindred, me and Damian Duffy, uh, it, you know, it's still selling pretty well. It's about to go, it's about to be uh, translated into Japanese, <laughs> um, which is wild. Um, and we were, really really excited about that and so was abrams and over a, a dinner conversation with the publisher i was like well you know i wanted to 
talk to him about doing other things, you know? And he was like, well, you just let us know what you want to adapt and we'll try to acquire it for you, right? And I was like, well, I was thinking about original content as well. And then he was like, oh, that sounds like an imprint. And so <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, it does. And so I started thinking about, well, what, would I, what kind of imprint would this be? So the name Megascope comes from a science fiction story that was found in uh, 2015, so like five years ago by uh, Adrian Brown and uh, Britt Russert, his two uh, professors who were going through Du Bois's papers. And they, uh, they came across a short story, a science fiction story called The Princess Steel that was written by W.E.B. Du Bois in about 1909. You know, so he's still actually uh, down in uh, Atlanta when he wrote this. Um, so the book, the book, I mean, it's, excuse me, this short story is about this um, this elderly sociologist who's created a device called the Megascope that he wants to show to people. So, so this white couple are in New York on their honeymoon or something like that, and they see the sign, "Come see the wondrous Megascope," right? And so it's this, so they walk into his space. Uh, they think he's the janitor at first, actually. <laughs> and then, of course. Uh, of course. And um, it turns out that the megascope is this device that can see into other realities. And I was like, and it's, and it's used as the framing mechanism for an allegory about the, uh, the US steel industry. And it's, um, it's actually put forth as a mystical, like, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien style uh, narrative. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? So it's science fiction, fantasy, you know, and it has this political satire. It's and it's it's this little tight little story that he never published. Okay, black folks, you heard it here, 1909. 1909. Black folks have done science fiction. Exactly. Like, let's not get it twisted. George Schuyler in the 20. Like, let's not get it twisted. 31. All right. 1931. Yeah. yeah. The yeah, Black yeah. Empire and all the Black No More. Colin Hopkins and uh, yeah. That's even earlier, I think. Anyway, but yeah, yeah so that would just be a great name for an imprint because the idea is that Megascope is trying to find new voices, uncover new voices, reintroduce uh, stories to a wider audience. So it's basically uh, primarily speculative fiction stories that are centered around people of BIPOC, you know, folk, you know, so um, which I think is a new parlance is BIPOC, right? Yeah, which will change next year. So, I mean, yeah, but still. <laughs> Who look like us and other people that look, you know, kind of like us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, so 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 that's kind of like the um, that's the gist of. We're also doing crime fiction because I love crime fiction, <laughs> and also uh, uh, some historical fiction too. So like, you know, we're doing a book with Sean Martin called The Heavy. That's essentially like a neo noir uh, book. It's almost like if you took like one of the Parker novels, but to be like, shout out to Sean too. He's a beast. That dude, yeah, you should. Man, <laughs> and then a ridiculous. Anyway, so very talented dude. The other thing too is like we're doing an Emmett Till book, for instance. I mean, like when you funny. when you do that type of stuff, like how do you take care of yourself? When you well, have to like delve into like the horrible things of an Emmett Till story, like how do you make sure that y'all don't like you know the trauma's real? I mean, here's the thing. I mean, the story itself is being written by the gentleman who co-wrote the definitive book on the case with his mother, Chris Benson. <laughs> so he's lived with this. He actually is really good friends with the family. He's actually done so much research and has you know wrote with the FBI when they started opening up the case, reopening the case and stuff like that. So, and he's a he's a journalist. So um, so the story is actually about um, the role of the writer and keeping the story pure and alive. Is actually kind of what it's about. So it's so he doesn't even even though it, the character looks like Chris Benson is he's never called Chris Benson. He's just called the writer. You know, and foregrounds uh, Mamie Till Mobley's story. And it really is about the making of the book that they wrote together to a certain degree. And um, yeah, it's, it's heavy. So it's like self-care. I mean, you know, I try to I try to like rest as much as possible. I have, a, you know, my family here with me, of course. Um, my little boy is what I think I focus on a lot now because, um, you know, he's he is the Afro future, you know, for real. Drooling every day and, you know, teething and, you know, chasing the dog, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so I try to, I try to do that, I try to spend as much time with my family as possible, you know, so binge watching Star Trek and, you know, uh, verbal jazz with my, with my beautiful wife, you know, <laughs> so like, she always wins though, she is quicker with it, you know. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta get the sparring yeah. gloves okay. in the house. Yeah, the family is my, is my bomb, I think, for that kind of stuff, because it's the reason why you do the things we do, is to kind of preserve this history, mm -hmm. it's part of like, doing a story about the Emmett Till case, for instance, is the fact that it has haunted me. I'm from Mississippi, so 
I grew up, you know, with that story looming over me all my life. And then, of course, you talk to someone like Chris Benson, who literally read the book manuscript he wrote with Mamie Till Mobley to her on her deathbed. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's heavy, man. And so, and then Eric Battle is the artist on that book. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, Shout out to Eric. It's about oh, that's 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 a hell of a that's gonna it's be a gonna squad. be that's a squad book. It's gonna be squad. Oh, yeah. I mean, we got some, super squad. You understand? Like you know, I'm going. I'm I'm working with people to who I I really love and admire. Like you know, we're doing a book with Jeremy Love as an artist, with Hoche Anderson as the writer. <laughs> <laughs> On this book called the Res the Resurrectionist. Then you, you got a Daniel Jose older book in the chamber. <laughs> and Chuck Collins. Chuck Connor together. Come on. <laughs> Shout out to Chuck and Daniel. Like Oh, and Baba Malik. Baba Malik. His his uh yeah, his um yeah. is is the co writing that in the in the Daniel. So but yeah, man, it's uh it's, it's been like, it's like, and there's some books I can't even talk about that we just signed that haven't even been announced yet. So I was just trying to be I and so the, the way I'm thinking about it is I was trying to put together either like the the deaf jucks of comics. <laughs> and, or like the, just stay together huh? <laughs> just make sure you, you stay, stay together, together. <laughs> make sure don't break like, you know, I'm talking about like yeah exactly stay together <laughs> or like the Def Jam you know yeah. um, where you have like everybody's fly but you just have different ways you know there's not mm -hmm. a you don't have a house style the house style is just be dope as hell you know yeah and that's and that's what's and that's what thing you know what was dope to me is looking at the what's on the slate looking at what's already been produced but also looking more into the your work you know your, your style is one that's uniquely suited, it seems to me, like for the subject matter you choose to explore, right? I don't want to see a slick uh, blue hand mojo. That's like, like, like you know, that's in the no. back. And I'm not saying that she forged that slick, but your characters always look like there's there's a kineticism mm -hmm. that's there. And blue hand mojo is actually a little bit more freaky on my second and third read than it was when I first read it because I started like really reading into it. So, yeah. like, like break us down. I mean, you ha you have the gorgeous panels in the back. Of you break yeah. down blue hand mojo. So blue hand mojo um, came. It's funny because I have a <laughs> it's kind of a, it's kind of a long story actually. Um, so I was actually working on this book that I was writing. Um, you know, I've, I've been working with Damian Duffy for like, oh my goodness, like 16 years, something like that. And, um, you know, I had this uh, I had this notion for a character called Pitch that was kind of like based off of me a little bit, but it was a supernatural, you know, kind of like uh, adventure story with a character that was an artist, a black artist who could actually like take people's trauma and, and paint it and then free them from the trauma. You know what I'm saying? So it's almost like, but it's mostly dead people. So it's almost like, like Ghost Whisperer, uh, <laughs> yeah, but like when, a, a sin eater for ghosts. Yeah, to a certain degue and but you but you paint it. So once once he paints the images, they're free. You know what I'm saying? He can you know, and it's it's an ability that he's had since he was a child, right? Oof. Actually, I might, I might actually re, re, revisit it. But I actually wrote this. I wrote a 250 page script for this thing, and I was drawing it, and I wanted to get it produced. And I actually like uh, took it to Comic Con actually. And um, what happened was I bumped into. Ted McKeever, who's like one of my influences, one of my favorite artists, actually. And um, he loved he loved the, uh, the work, you know. And so he was like, I want to take you. You need to meet Jim, you know. So this brother, you know, he got up from his table and took me over to see Jim. You know, he had his wife cover his table. And this is like my first Comic-Con, right? And I'm walking with one of my hero one artistic heroes, right? And so he takes me to Jim, and he met Jim Valentino. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, what? So yeah, so I showed his showed his work to Jim Valentino. He loves it. When I tell him the story, he's like, okay, um, I can't, you know, I can't really invest, you know, in this project right now because, you know, can't invest ten grand in trying to get this project done because it's it's about a black man who basically frees slaves from their trauma. <laughs> These days, you probably jump at it, right? Yeah. Then he said, bring me something I can use. And I was like, huh. So, so okay, that's a, that's good, right? So I went back and I took and I started thinking about some things I was interested in. Uh, I always was always a big fan of like you know detective stories, and I'm a huge fan of like characters like you know Harry Dresden and like um, John Constantine, these kind of like urban mage characters. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I kind of took the idea of the blues detective, you know, which is like the black urban detective, you know, in, in, in inner cities, and merged it with like a, a mage of some kind. But instead of using like European centered like magic, I wanted to use conjure and hoodoo, you know? 
And coming from Mississippi, I wanted it to be to kind of dial into, you know, our folklore, like we've been saying. So, um, yeah, so 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 Half Dead Johnson, Frank Half Dead Johnson is the fictitious cousin of Robert Johnson. So he makes <laughs> so if you know your 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 uh, your your blues history or blues uh mythology, mythology. <laughs> uh Robert Johnson is, you know, one of the greatest bluesmen that ever lived, who basically uh supposedly goes to like this this uh this crossroads in, in the Mississippi Delta and makes a clandestine deal with the quote unquote devil for uh, virtuosity as a blues for a blues to become a blues guitarist and overnight he becomes like amazing right so but in my story um, Frank is a um, his younger cousin uh, who knows about this story um, he basically ends up uh, in a, such a situation where his his family uh, is being him and his family are about to be lynched you know but essentially what he does is and I, just the backstory is that he actually wins a lot of his uh a lot of money from these wealthy white landowners you know not by magic or anything he's just lucky he just actually he's a gambler and he still he basically wins a lot of money and uh they get pissed off about it and they come after him you know and so what ends up happening is uh, his family uh, and him and his family get you know hung and so what happens is his rope breaks you know and he's able to escape and what he does is he makes a deal uh, with this with this entity at the at the crossroads after a long night of drinking moonshine, you know, and wishes for the power to conjure up, you know, revenge against his enemies, you know, which he does in devastating fashion. I, one of these days, you know, I already, I, I've already kind of written that story in my head. I know exactly how it's going to go. But then he realizes that he's made a terrible mistake, that he's like, now he owes his soul to the devil. <laughs> and he has the guilt of... Um, his family being hung because of him, you know, gambling, you know, which is his, his, his wife hated anyway. And then he also has killed these people, you know, they killed his family and it didn't bring him any, any solace, you know? So he's a very, very uh, complex character, you know? And so what ends up happening is he figures out a way to trick the devil out of giving half of the soul back. <laughs> so that's why it's called half dead. So um, he, he basically uh, says, hey, I got these other souls that I can barter you know, if you can, you know, hook me up with this deal. And so he beats the devil in a craps game, you know, because the devil can only throw sixes, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he beats him. And the devil's like, oh, my God, you know, you're so slick, man. Um, you should come and work for me. I tell you what, I'll give you half your soul back. And the rest of it, you're going to work off as my cycle pump. So essentially what he does is, like, he sometimes he collects souls for the devil. He's like one of the devil's collection agents, right? In the middle, in the in the meantime, he tries to use his powers to kind of like, you know, balance out the the odds a little bit more, you know, kind of, kind of a little bit more like the Keanu Reeves Constantine in some ways, where he's trying to you know even the score so to speak, and try to you know. So that's that's the background of uh, of of of, um, of Blue Hand Mojo. The other thing is, uh, the devil, if you read your Bible, is going to be thrown into hell for eternity at the end of time anyway. Eventually, he's going to be put in the chains and. I want to say that's in Revelations, so and I forgot which book it's in. But uh, but yeah, so the devil is actually supposed to spend the rest of his time like locked up, you know. So he wants some company, so to speak. So he loves music, you know. Blues is called the devil's music, right? So um, basically, what happens is like certain souls resonate in a particular frequency. So he's um, collecting particular souls that actually get transcribed into music notes. So some of the souls he's collect. So so basically, he's he's composing a song. It's called the uh, the lowdown devil blues, and it's to keep you know the devil company while he's uh, whiling away, chained up for eternity. So that's the I mean, story. So, <laughs> which is crazy. A, how do you not get nightmares? <laughs> and B, why do you think it's important to kind of like de-Christian stigmatize the supernatural for Black people? You know, I mean, because they're so. <laughs> Our, our belief structures are are wonderful. Like the you know the, the kind of like the African diasporic religions that came over with the slaves uh, are remarkable and spirit and, and are not evil. You know and that's that's the thing is like coming up uh, in Mississippi in the South you know and in, in the rural South everything that wasn't Christian was the devil. You know what I'm saying <laughs> everything's the devil. That's the that's demonic. You know that kind of thing. It's like, no, that's actually like um, that's your well Christianity. <laughs> And also, these are the things that fed your ancestors. These are the things that feed your spirit, you know. Um, also, too, I love the uh, the fact that 
even though we don't like to talk about it too much, there's always this um, this idea of uh, 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 the sacred and the profane, like being like right next to each other. The same piano player that plays at the joint plays at, plays piano at the church like the next you know that Sunday. You know, what I'm saying. And I love it. that's one of the things I actually really enjoyed about the color purple. You know, honestly, the movie. Yeah. Where you have like, you know, um, uh, what's her name? The Suge, Suge Avery is one of the greatest gospel singers and also one of the greatest blues singers at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like that kind of thing. Uh, those things exist in the, same, in the same space. And that's what, that's why I love the idea of the crossroads, you know? That's why Jackson's named Jackson with an X in the middle of his name, by the way. <laughs> On the oh, yeah, because- Oh, got a baby Easter egg. Yes, a baby Easter egg, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my, 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 my grandfather, Albert, you know, was illiterate and he signed his name with an X. So, mm -hmm. like, literally. So, so Jackson's kind of named after him. A little bit because he has an X in the middle of his name, but it also represents possibility. So, yeah. um, and the unknown, yeah, and the unknown, like, yeah, and the unknown. And there's something about that is dope. Like naming is a very important. Oh, it's very. We took it very. Like, yeah, like for our daughter, we, we wanted to make sure that her name can never be truncated. Right. So you have to say you have to say the thing all the time, and people right. try to truncate it, and it just doesn't work. Yeah, it just doesn't, really? like, sense doesn't really sound right, you know. <laughs> you can't, you know, if you try to say hi, hi, I'm like, hi, nah, hi, yeah. Hi. Yeah, it's like, man. Yeah. Oh. Now, you guys said the whole thing and, and encompass all of it, what it means. You know, <laughs> and I think, <laughs> which I mean, but I think also, too, like, I, I, I hate adding punk to everything, right? Right. But there's this thing that we should talk about um, called conjure punk. Yes. Yeah. And I don't want, I, I hate putting punk as, uh, just because I think it's, it's, a, it's a cheap way to, to describe something, but you have David, we got Bitter Root, right. David Sanford and all them, then you got right. all the stuff that worked at Blue Hand Mojo. There's this one dope book, I forgot, it was about a brothel in the South, and the lady was a witch and sweet to cast the alligators, and I forgot what oh, the yeah, yeah. book it was. was. Yeah, it was a uh, juke joint. Juke joint, juke joint, which is yeah, it's only got like, two issues. Yeah, like, what happened? That book yeah. was so dope. I know, I was, um, yeah, I, I like T. Franklin's work quite a bit, actually, because also uh, she, she wrote, um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, the Lesbian Love Story. Uh, Lucky, oh, shoot. The, ah, never mind. I can't think of it right now. Um, oh, I can see the cover, but I can't think of it. But I can see the cover, but I can't think joint of it. was so, was, was it great. not Big Love? Luck, luck. Oh, I can't think of what it was it called. Was, it was something like, yeah, it was something like that. You know, I can't think of it right now. My daughter read it. I gotta. I, I can see the cover. Yeah, but but was, that. But Juke Joint was dope. But what is it about? All of my students loved it too. The men and the women. You know, yeah, they, it's incredible. Yeah, and they they love that book. And, and I teach it. I teach in my my. Okay. Class, you know. So anyway, but not, I mean, then you have, I mean, you know, Lovecraft Country, right? Yeah. Like not the book, which no diss, but what the film did. Yes. Or the film, I mean, the, 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 the miniseries series yeah, did, to, uh, is completely, I mean, it's contrapunk. I feel like they were reading our notes, you know what I'm saying? Whenever, when I read, I was like, <laughs> yo, there's somebody, been, they've been, you know, there's a contingent of us, yourself included, that's been talking about this stuff outwardly for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So when I think about contrapunk, I'm thinking about, first of all, you know, I like to, um, I like to mix up and, and mess with white folks stuff particularly people like Lovecraft and, you know, racist creators and things of that nature, because, and juxtapose our work with that and kind of like mix it up. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, when we talk about like technology, you know what I'm saying? We're actually talking about ways of understanding and meaning and like they're extensions of ourselves. So hoodoo is just as much a technology as, you know, digital technology is, you know, mm -hmm. it just, it just uh, presents itself differently. It's a different type of technology. Um, but it is a type of technology, you know, because you have like different types of systems of learning, so to speak. Yeah. And so if you look at something like cyberpunk, you know, which is created in what late seventies and kind of, kind of peters out as a, as a, as a viable um, expression to a certain degree in like the early two thousands, probably if you look at like something like the matrix was probably like the great, like the last great. And that was uh, what, 90, 98, 99, the matrix. Like, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, 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 the aesthetics and the mentality of what it means to be a punk to a certain degree it was like it was kind of like taking the idea of being like a rabble rouser and like pushing you know that kind of thing and so wild diy too diy and stuff like that that's right and also to societies falling apart and technology is very high you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so i was thinking about well you know how do we first of all how do we like um create different strands of black speculative culture because i look at myself now as kind of an afro speculative creator mm -hmm. right because i do science fiction do superheroes i do horror you know 
and all the speculative, you know, and I'm coming from a black perspective, right? From a very like African diaspora, black centric, you know, lens, you know, and epistemology even, right? So you know, just suppose that with like say cyberpunk, I was like, okay, what if you start mixing, you start putting other types of power sources in there? Because essentially what starts happening is you start seeing like steampunk happens, mm -hmm. right? Diesel because punk. <laughs> so cyber is so cyber is the kind of like societal norm around like the energy, you know, or the type of technology. And punk is the mentality, you know what I'm saying? So or it's like so it's against the systemic issues, mm -hmm. right? So you got diesel punk, right? You got, you know, steampunk. And of course now people like Milton Davis are like, oh, what about steam funk? Which is yeah. like, Black sword, and sword and soul, you know, we, oh, we, exactly. we've taken white people's stuff and remixing it. Exactly, it's a remix, exactly. And so I was like, well, Conjure is the theoretical aspects of, you know, spiritual aspects of hoodoo, you know what I'm saying? You have the root work piece and you have like Conjure and things of that nature. So I was like, Conjure Punk is basically mixing the ideas of like digital technology with the spiritual like uh, groundings of like, you know, Conjure or like hoodoo, essentially, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I think that Frank Johnson's character because he extremely he he can't die until he's worked off his contract you know so he lives into like the future into like a digital space and so I can't wait to start telling stories of him as a conjure man living in like a cyberpunk space you know and um and I like mix I like crossing those those threads so to speak you know um there's a there's a video there's a, either a video game or role playing game is it Shadow Run that does that yeah Shadow Run it's an old like magic um, game. yeah it was magic and like future el cyber elves and yeah yeah yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. That, you know, that game was fun to play actually that was one of my favorite yeah, role playing games back in the day but i, I like the concepts you know what i'm saying because i like like okay well everything doesn't have to be pure you know because we're not you know why, why not like play around with things a little bit more like why not make a super you know because i like you know take a superhero character that's just that's powered by magic you know like the crow or something you know or mm -hmm. like I, I love that kind of stuff you know anyway so that's kind of like the ideas, you know. And there seems to be like these, like these kind of waves, right? I mean, we can talk about 2018 and Black Panther. You know, we can talk about that. You know, rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman. Yeah. We could talk about, you know, before that, the rise of kind of like, you know. So some people would argue that, you know, Black Panther was Afrofuturism, right? And I would argue that it's not. I'd argue that it was Black science fiction. I think there's, I think there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I think I'm because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think that Black Panther was about literally at the end it was about assimilation and coming into where I think Afrofuturism is about not having to pay attention to that. We're creating something new over here. Yeah. And but so we had, you know, Afrofuturism, you know, the Afro surrealism and all these things. But like, do you think Conjure Punk is on that next like big wave of becoming the new methodology through which to create? Or do you think it's still going to stay in its kind of like its pocket? Like basically, do you think it'll be cyberpunk levels or do you think it's going to stay in a very particular pocket and probably and hopefully not be um overused and overdone you know that's a good point you know i i don't know i mean i think for me when i started like creating these new terminologies because you know i also came with the term eth the ethnographic right was another joint right which has a different type of function to it um i guess i was trying to make like purposeful you know uh thought processes about what i was doing you know mm -hmm. and also to push back against the like putting everything other afrofuturism Yes. Um, Thank you, God. You know, appreciate you, Mark Derry. You know, uh, for giving a name to, to you know to practices that we've been doing. But you know, I thought it was you know it's a cool it's a cool like way to start talking about Black speculative culture. You know, it's a great entry point. It's a great entry but point. before that, you now we talk about Mark Derry, but what we don't talk about is Dr. Alondra Nelson. And Alondra if you weren't Nelson. part, and if you weren't part of the Afrofuturist board back in the day, if you didn't yeah. read that issue of Social Text, if yeah. you're not considering, you know, everybody's talking about Sun Ra, but not talking about Lee Scratch Perry. Some That's of y'all's right. Afrofuturism scholarship is garbage yeah, and it's incomplete because if you're not mentioning Dr. Alondra Nelson and giving that woman her props, I just, I can't take your scholarship no, no, seriously. Right. She's, she's definitely absolutely right. Um, so I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really think about it like that. I just try to make the things that I want and I don't necessarily need for it to proliferate. I know what I'm making and why, but I think like, um, I'm, I'm borrowing from people like Kyle Shun, of course, you know, where he's making up all these different terminologies for mm -hmm. things. Creating. The king of neologisms. Like, he's right. the king of it. But, yeah. I'm just, but for me, it's like, it's like for artists coming up behind you, like, I'm just wondering how much do you think, how much permission do they have? Like, oh, you mean I can talk about my grandma's root work in here? You know, I mean, I, mean, I think also there's a war between blackness and Christianity in a way that, you know, when it comes to creation, like, we don't want to talk about the demonized stuff mm -hmm. when that's our origins. 
Right. That's what I'm saying. Different yeah. ways. I, I, I like mixing it up like that. I'm, I just think you make the kind of thing that, that makes you feel good. Or, and, and also, you make the thing that has the kind of conversation that you want to have. Um, I don't like the, I like categories that are mutable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, coming out of the academy, you always like have to talk about theory from a particular standpoint. And I was like, okay, well, let's make it up on the fly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so let, let, let's see what the next thing is by just making that next thing. And then you say, oh, you know what? This is what I'm doing. You know, and that's kind of like what it is. You know, I was like, I was making cy black cyborgs way before I understood what Afrofuturism was, you know, because it just seemed right to me, you know? And I think it's important to also have a, a, a African diaspora generated creative lexicon. Yeah. Because I don't think that sometimes we have, you look at like, you know, you start you're looking at, you know, comic books and it's like this comes from greek mythology this yeah. comes from norse mythology this comes from arthurian mythos this comes from and they have those like these cultural touch points but i think that what black people do what we're good at is we make yes i'm like we made hip-hop out of what Car poverty and distress in a stick you know a stick of bubble gum <laughs> you know i mean and then look where hip-hop is i'll tell you a funny story my wife and i were in cebu philippines Mm. Which, and we were in the city called Car Car, which is like pretty much almost the southernmost city on the island. We're driving through the dang rainforest, seeing Carabao, and there's like a burnt out church, and on the wall is spray painted Snoop Dogg. Wow. I'm like, we are in the jungle, jungle. Right. And Snoop Dogg, like, it's everywhere. Like, it's interesting because I think, because like, I think the the very existence of blackness itself is conjured in reinvention culture. Yeah, no, for us, right. I, I agree. You know, yeah. like, how are we still here? Right. And that's one thing about what well, interests me about hoodoo is like, you know, it's a type of practice that is about uh, using the elements around you and then applying your knowledge and your belief structures to the things that are around you. And I think that's one of the reasons why people love, why black folk love MacGyver so much, you know. Every yeah. black person loves MacGyver. <laughs> Yeah, because because MacGyver, you know, man, yeah, you got a black grandmama or something. Because you know what I'm saying, like, well, I'm gonna take this stick of gum and this battery, and we're gonna blow out, we're gonna blow up <laughs> <laughs> a whole nuclear power plant. I know, that dude, I'm like, yes. But there's something about the making, though. Like our grandparents, yeah, you know, like did things. Like your grandfather, you know, I don't know about your, but my grandfather, rest his soul, could fix anything. Yeah, I feel like, like from, from lawnmowers to 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 the, to the carburetor. Yes. To my grandmother's sewing machine, like he would just fix it, and there was a, there was this level of, of just we have to do this because we can't afford to buy a new one, so we're just gonna make it. And but the the, the necessity or the skills that come out of out of out of poverty, the skills that come out of are our default. But here we are now on a damn Zoom, you know, future technology talking about black culture from the past to the future, yes. and that 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 black folks are still alive, making the art that you're making, making the arts that you and your contemporaries are making, is proof that white supremacy isn't all powerful. That's right. That's totally true. You, you yeah. tried to get rid of us. Now your kid wants to be us. Yep. Just <laughs> rhyme like us, slang mm -hmm. like us, dress like us, draw like us. Right. I mean, there's something powerful about the, the I won't use the word magic, but I'll use the word magic. There is a, there's a magic in black creative processes yeah. that there's like a trans transmutations that we do, transfigurations that we do, you know, we do sigil work on trains that mean yes. something more. I mean, there's so much of that mystical in our work itself. It's too bad that most of us, so many of us are scared of it because yeah, of our, I, because of our upgrading bringings. That's the thing is I, I, you know, I try to like make them, you know, make beautifully horrific images that make you, you know, you don't want to look. You know, you look at something like Box of Bones, for instance, you know, like, you know, yeah, what? something wrong with you and I easy. I'm just gonna put it out there. Like, cause I looked at Box of Bones, I got the PDF and I was like, oh, word, like what's wrong <laughs> with y'all? Like, what were you thinking about? I'm reading it at bedtime too on an iPad. Like now it's glowing. Like what's, yeah, it's just the worst. That was not good. <laughs> it's so dope though, because you do, there's something about black life and the monstrous, mm -hmm. like having to constantly come into contact Yes. You look at all them pictures of those white folks looking at Ruby Bridges. You're like, that's monsters. That's right. Like, forget people. They've actually tr they transformed into something different for this and, context. Yeah, that's what I love about Bitter Root, you know. And, yes. Uh, and also that mythology. I mean, the same thing with like stories like Ring Shout and, and other, you know, other books like that, where it's like, the, to me, you start. I don't think it's not necessarily about being original. It's about like these are these are these are belief structures that are in our communities that are coming to light that are actually 
being spread now, you know, and actually become part of how um, our lived experience. You know, when you think about, you, you mentioned Afro-surrealism, right? So a lot of the tenets of Afro-surrealism are about like, well, because of, you know, white supremacy and oppression, the black experience becomes a strange, uncanny experience, right? And so a lot of it is about trying to have that experience of being black in America, being co-present with quote unquote reality, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's amazing, you know what I'm saying? Cause that everybody knows what that feels like, <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're black in America, you know, you like say, oh, this is very strange, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and being on parallel psychic tracks without yeah. going, without losing your mind. That's right. Being yeah. able to incorporate the two, because we are actually kind of like generating and regenerating ontologies and epistemologies daily just to deal with what we're dealing with yeah. mm -hmm. you know like last week when the capital was stormed as black folks we were able to opt out of that conversation like we told you already yeah yeah what about, now what? you know what we feel like every moment of every single day exactly so so one of my friends Courtney Baker had this shirt and said uh, <laughs> she put it up on Instagram and she had it on and it was like um we told y'all and then it says African American proverb. <laughs> we oh don't. man! <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the truth because, like, when you listen to the people who have survived the trauma, mm -hmm. like we yeah. know what this can happen. We're trying to tell you that it's Our happening. Ancestors used to be objects. <laughs> our, our, shoot! <laughs> I mean, like, this can't happen in America. You brought y'all kids to lynchings, right? Like would, this is America. Shout out to yeah. shout out to, to to Donald Glover. You know what I'm saying? You made a you made a, a, a you know postcards of it. You know what I'm saying? And and had pieces of finger bones as family heirlooms. Exactly. Like, Years. come on, people. Yeah. And but I think what your monstrous work does, John, is that it lets us look into the dark, turn the lights on, and being able to name the demon. There you go. And I, and I yeah. think I think you being able to do that is it's a powerful permission. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And, that, and that's, what, that's what the ethnogothic is about. I did, the ethnogothic is about naming that demon so you can get rid of it. And then or master we, it. And they're like, come on, we got, some, we got some work to do, homie. <laughs> Go over here. Yeah, that's what I think. So, yeah, that's what I think Frank, Frank Half Dead Johnson does. He's mastered his demons. He, he's definitely, and I like about uh, Frank is like he's not a likable character <laughs> at all. He's not a nice man. And, and, and oh. be, when you look at what he's gone through, you understand why, you know? Yeah, I mean, how many of us are walking around right now with trauma, maybe multi-generational epigenetic trauma yeah. that we've never had the mechanisms to get rid of, to address in any real way. And I think that what your art does is allows us to be able to to look at and process, to externalize that trauma in ways. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's for me, that's the number one value of conjure culture. Yeah. Is the ability to kind of like take all of that Put it outside of yourself, and then you gotta reckon with it. Figure right. out what you're gonna do. Figure out what you're gonna do with it. As opposed to, this mm -hmm. isn't me. This is something that's happening to me. So I do have some measure of a control. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with that. So yeah, so that's kind of like why I make those images. They make me feel better. They're cathartic, but they also um, hopefully are. I try to make them uh, informed by um, a particular politic, a particular type of um, you know Afrocentric aesthetic that privileges our pain. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and 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 actually, <clears throat> but doesn't revel in it. You know what I'm saying? There's a sort of there's a sort of glee and like reverence mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the work that I try to put into it. And a know? level of whimsy. There's a level of whimsy, yeah. And I, I think it's dope because it could be heavy. That's right. It can be very heavy. Um, but I choose not to go that way. I, I I want to have, and also too, I want them to feel like they're moving. So I definitely am really influenced by like the people like Ted McKeever, Klaus Janssen, Frank Miller. But also people like, um, you know, Franz Masrio, Egon Schiele, you know, uh, Lynn Ward, um, Kathy Colwitz in particular is a big, you know, I like her to work a lot actually. So I'm always trying to infuse um, the work with that kind of like kinetic um, abstraction, you know? That's what's just dope. So as we reach our time, John, I'm gonna ask you three rapid fire questions. Uh -oh. You can't overthink, you can't overanalyze, you just gotta answer the questions. Uh, man, come on. Okay. You know, this is what I do. <laughs> so um, for budding new artists, one piece of advice. Don't stop. Do not stop. Yeah, don't stop making the work. And also tell people about your work. That's the other thing. I know that's two, but. No, that's not. <laughs> the thing is, like, don't, don't be afraid, afraid to show your work, you know. Yeah. So one habit or tool 
for artistic production that you find the most valuable? Um, editing, you know, some revision, you know, go back, look at things um, differently, be really critical of your own work, you know, don't be afraid to change it. Don't, don't fall in love with something you think is done, you know, it's always room for improvement. So. And if you could gift every single person watching this one graphic novel, what would you gift them? Ooh, that's a good question. Oh, probably um, for me, probably Born Again by, by uh, Frank Miller and David Mazzuccelli. So Darede the Daredevil story? Yeah, man. Yes. A, I think that's a beautiful thing. It's 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 absolutely amazing. I have, a, I have the artist edition right behind me, actually. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if you have never read superheroes, this is just, not, it, it transcends superhero. Yeah. Like it's it's yeah. I mean, mine's over there. <laughs> I don't have the artist edition. I'm not. I'm not boss like that. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah. So that would probably be one. You know. So. Anyway. So, Mr. John, Professor John Jennings, thank you so much. And so, folks at BCAP, our seventh anniversary. You have no idea how dope right. that is. If we try to do it. You got the Schomburg also this weekend. Right. You got this. And so, black dopeness from coast to coast. Thank you all, everybody. Please check out the other panels. Take care of yourselves. Peace, everyone. Peace.